e benvenuti a tutti. Do il benvenuto a Sua Eccellenza Miroslav Gacevic, Vice Ministro per l'Integrazione Europea della Repubblica di Serbia. E lo ringrazio per la sua straordinaria presenza quest'oggi. Do il benvenuto all'onorevole Victoria Fortuna, ex procuratore generale anticorruzione della Repubblica di Moldavia e candidata alla prossima elezione presidenziali. Do inoltre il benvenuto al professore Felipe Pate Duarte dell'Università Nova di Lisbona, nostro moderatore di questo dibattito. Grazie a tutti per essere oggi intervenuti a questa conferenza. Cari ospiti e cari colleghi, è un onore essere qui con voi oggi a discutere di un tema di grande rilevanza per il futuro dell'Europa, tema come l'integrazione dei Paesi vicini dell'Unione Europea, con un focus particolare sulla Serbia e sulla Moldavia. Ringrazio in particolare il Vice Ministro Gacevic per la sua presenza e l'importante ruolo che ricopre e per l'impegno su questo. Grazie. Ringrazio l'onorevole Vittoria Fortuna che ha svolto un lavoro straordinario nella lotta alla corruzione in Moldavia e ringrazio anche il professore Duarte per il suo prezioso contributo come moderatore. L'integrazione europea, come tutti sappiamo, non è solo una questione geopolitica. È un progetto che riguarda la costruzione di una comunità di valori, di cooperazione economica e di pace e duratura tra popoli che hanno radici culturali e religiose comuni. Oggi voglio concentrare la mia attenzione su due Paesi che rappresentano per noi partner strategici, sia per noi che per l'Europa, la Serbia e la Moldavia. Comincio con la Serbia, un paese amico e partner storico dell'Italia. I nostri legami sono profondi e radicati non solo in ambito economico, ma anche culturale e politico. La Serbia è il principale partner commerciale dell'Italia nei Balcani occidentali, con scambi bilaterali che continuano a crescere in settori chiave, come l'industria manifatturiera, l'energia, le infrastrutture, l'information technology. Nel 2023 l'interscambio commerciale tra Serbia e Italia ha superato ben i 4 miliardi di euro, confermando l'importanza di una cooperazione economica stretta e reciproca. Ma il nostro rapporto con la Serbia va oltre l'economia. L'Italia e la Serbia condividono una visione comune di pace e di stabilità per i Balcani occidentali. L'integrazione europea della Serbia è certamente un obiettivo molto importante, ma insieme dobbiamo anche assicurarci di garantire pace e stabilità nella regione. È qui che l'Europa deve giocare un ruolo cruciale. La questione delle tensioni tra Serbia e Kosovo non può essere risolta soltanto tra protagonisti locali. Tutti noi dobbiamo dare il nostro contributo, comprendendo le ragioni delle due parti e scongiurando potenziali conflitti. L'Unione Europea deve fornire tutto il suo contributo per facilitare il dialogo e rafforzare la cooperazione in modo che si possa evitare qualsiasi escalation. Solo un incremento della cooperazione e del dialogo potrà portare alla pace e alla stabilità nei Balcani. Dobbiamo lavorare affinché la Serbia diventi un baricentro di stabilità e crescita nella regione. Per raggiungere questo obiettivo, L'Europa deve fornire alla Serbia tutti gli strumenti necessari per consolidare il suo ruolo strategico nei Balcani occidentali. Una Serbia stabile e prospera sarà un elemento chiave per tutta la stabilità dell'area. Una Serbia forte è per noi un'assoluta garanzia. Passiamo ora alla Moldavia. Un paese 
che sta attraversando una fase cruciale nel suo percorso verso l'integrazione europea. Io desidero esprimere il mio profondo apprezzamento per l'onorevole Vittoria Fortuna che nel suo ruolo di procuratore generale anticorruzione ha svolto un lavoro davvero straordinario nella lotta contro la corruzione stessa. Grazie. Le sue azioni hanno contribuito significativamente a migliorare le istituzioni democratiche della Moldavia, avvicinandola ulteriormente agli standard europei e dimostrando come una giustizia indipendente e forte sia il fondamento di una società democratica. I legami tra l'Italia e la Moldavia sono anch'essi forti e radicati. La nostra cooperazione economica è in crescita, con migliaia di aziende italiane attive nel Paese e una comunità moldava che in Italia contribuisce quotidianamente al nostro sviluppo sociale ed economico. I rapporti culturali tra i due Paesi sono solidi e l'Italia ha da sempre sostenuto il processo di integrazione della Moldavia, riconoscendo l'importanza strategica di un Paese che si affaccia direttamente sull'Europa orientale. Non possiamo ignorare il fatto che la Moldavia si trova di fronte a sfide geopolitiche complesse. Il conflitto congelato in Transnistria rimane una minaccia latente alla stabilità del Paese. È fondamentale che tutti gli attori internazionali diano il loro contributo per evitare anche qui l'escalation delle tensioni e per garantire una pace duratura nella regione. In questo contesto il rispetto dei diritti di tutti i cittadini moldavi, indipendentemente dalle loro origini etniche o politiche, deve essere una priorità. Solo garantendo i diritti di tutti potremmo assicurare che la Moldavia continui a percorrere la strada della stabilità e della crescita. Il percorso della Moldavia verso l'Unione Europea è una sfida, ma anche un'opportunità. I legami economici tra l'Unione Europea e la Moldavia continuano a rafforzarsi, con oltre il 70% delle esportazioni in Moldave dirette verso i paesi dell'Unione Europea. Tuttavia, è essenziale che l'Europa continui a supportare il Paese, non solo a livello economico, ma anche nel consolidamento delle istituzioni democratiche, così che possa proseguire il suo cammino verso una piena adesione all'Unione. Concludo. L'integrazione europea di Serbia e di Moldavia rappresenta una sfida, ma soprattutto un'opportunità per tutta l'Europa. L'Italia continuerà a sostenere con forza questi Paesi nel loro percorso, perché crediamo che un'Europa più ampia e inclusiva sia un'Europa più sicura, più stabile e sicuramente più prospera. Io ho creato questa occasione oggi soprattutto per ascoltare i nostri onorevoli ospiti e i nostri onorevoli relatori affinché possano dirci cosa l'Italia e l'Europa possano ulteriormente fare per dare il loro contributo nel processo di integrazione europea e nel sostegno fattivo ai due Paesi. Io ringrazio ancora una volta il Vice Ministro Gacevic, l'Onorevole Vittoria Fortuna e il Professor Felipe Pate Duarte per i loro interventi e sono fiduciosa che attraverso il dialogo e la cooperazione possiamo costruire un futuro migliore per l'Europa e sicuramente per tutti i suoi vicini. Grazie, grazie per l'attenzione, grazie, grazie a tutti. Thank you very much. Good afternoon all. Uh, and for now I'll speak in English, very slowly in English. Um, and let me start saying at least two or three things. The first, just saying that um, 
it's an honor to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, at this, this Camera dei Deputati. And of course, it's an honor um, to be received by this camera. And of course, I would like to say a word to our hosts here, uh, the Honorable MP Naike Grupione. And it's an honor and a pleasure to be here uh, to debate such interesting subjects and emergent subject, which is the enlargement of the European Union. But before to start and to, to pass the word to give floor to our, um, to our speakers, um, let me lift here a few problems concerning the situation. The first is that we should bear in mind that what is happening, it's in uh, the wake of the Russian war on Ukraine. And basically this long stalled ambition for new members in the European Union just have or has a remarkable revival. So it's not new, it ended, and then in the last two, three years, it had a revival. It has such a revival that European leaders such as Macron want to accelerate the process. And then we have the so-called Agenda 2030 that uh, established that until 2030, at least nine, we have nine candidates right now. Uh, part of those nine candidates or all the nine candidates might be uh, members of the European Union. Just to bear in mind, just I uh, can do the list right now, which, which countries are that? So just Albania, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Georgia, Kosovo, North Macedonia, uh, Moldova, Serbia, Turkey, and Ukraine. We can find here a quite interesting geopolitical trend, a quite interesting geographic perspective. So those nine countries, uh, at least part of them are already working on it. I'm not talking about Turkey, which is or was the permanent uh, candidate for European Union, but at least half of those countries are working a lot to become members in um, 2030. Uh, but this arises or rouses a few questions, and the first is, can this enlargement work for the European Union? I think we need to reflect about that. Thinking about the main uh, mantras that define the European Union process, which is um, the deepening and the widening. Thinking about deepening, it's about the gradual or the formal process of vertical institutionalization. So can we bear more members? Are the way how we're working uh, allows the possibility for new members? Should our institutions be capable to absorb new members? Um, the second question, uh, it's about those nine countries. Do they accomplish the three Copenhagen criteria? As you probably know, we have at least three criteria, one political, another economic, and another one institutional. Political, it's if those countries have capacity to, um, uh, to, uh, to rule by the rule of law, if those countries have capacity to uh, rule according to human rights, um, so if it is a strong uh, uh, political institution that allows the possibility of the rule of law. Economic, if those countries have capacity uh, to absorb the European economy or be in certain European economy. And finally, about um, the institution, if they have, uh, there is the, job, uh, the acceptance of the community equity. So should they do that? They are capable for that. And third, beside, behind, uh, besides um, the capacity of the European Union, their own capacity, we have the geopolitical situation. And this geopolitical situation uh, uh, leads two more questions. One, uh, the impact of those countries in the European Union and second, if they don't enter, what would this represent for the European Union concerning the geopolitical competition 
in the area and concerning our adversaries and our neighbors, uh, concerning the spheres, concerning possible satellites. So what would be the role of the European Union? So in one side we, ha we have an institutional impact and on the other side we have a geopolitical impact. So basically those are the countries, but better, uh, those are the, the, the questions, but better than me. Uh, uh, I would like to give the floor first um, to Honorable Victoria Fortuna, uh, um, a former anti-corruption general attorney of the Republic of Moldova and a candidate to um, the presidency of Moldova and the election will be in 40 days. Uh, and please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, let me remind you the rules are quite simple. Uh, um, you have about 15 minutes, 12, 15 minutes um, uh, for your presentation. Uh, and then after the two presentations, I will give room uh, for the audience to put questions. And in a quite informal way, I think we can establish here a debate in order to um, clarify a few ideas. Thank you very much. Please, the floor is yours. Honorable member del Parlamento, care ospite. È un grande onore per me parlare oggi tra questa mura, nella città dove molti secoli fa fu creato un grande Stato. Un Stato che da allora molti hanno cercato di replicare. Il tema dell'evento di oggi è l'argomento dell'Unione Europea. E sì, il mio Paese è un vicino dell'Unione Europea. Inoltre l'attuale governo ha annunciato un referendum per adizione dell'Unione Europea e vorrebbe che l'intenzione di aderare sia sanciata dalla nostra Costituzione. È sempre fantastico, ma per ballare in tango ci vogliono due persone. Immagina che una di voi piace una donna a un uomo sconosciuto. Puoi indire un referendum per entrare in una relazione con lei? Or lui. I tuoi vicini, i tuoi amici, il tuo gatto, puoi dire o votare sì, ma puoi significare qualcosa senza il consenso della persona stessa? A Bruxelles ci sono persone obiettive, vedono la corruzione del nostro paese, vedono l'economia morende del nostro Stato, vedono la repressione politica e l'instabilità. Ancora peggio, vedono che non c'è assolutamente alcun senso che la situazione possa migliorare nel prossimo futuro. È difficile per me ammetterlo perché amo il mio paese dal tutto il cuore. Ma devo dirlo, l'Europa non ha bisogno di Moldavia simile. E si ringrazio sinceramente Peter Schilzo che hanno detto apertamente e non di eloquente perché la mara verità è meglio di una bella bugia. Oggi proverò ad essere trasparente. Ad esempio che in Europa esiste già un paese che ha voluto da davvero uh, entrare nell'Unione Europea. E addirittura sancito questa intenzione della Costituzione, come ha voluto il nostro Presidente per noi. Inoltre è da dieci anni che a questo Paese è stata promessa dall'addizione all'Unione Europea. A tabelle di marcia vengono approvati, si vantano e promettono costantemente che manca poco. Questo Paese, lo sapete, è Ucraina. E nessun politico onesto non vorrebbe mai similare destino per suo paese. Ho detto di nuovo la parola onesto, politico onesto, perché voi lo sapete che ci sono anche politici disonesti. La guerra significa tanto soldi. La guerra significa il potere illimitato. La guerra è la migliore giustificazione da dare alle persone che improvvisamente potrebbero chiedersi perché sono passati dieci anni e non siamo ancora in Unione 
europea. La nebbia della guerra nasconde tutto. Ecco perché l'attuale governo sostiene la escalazione del conflitto. Ecco perché sotto la nostra Presidente Moldavia si rimpiera di armi ed è per questo continueranno a ricontrarci favore sull'Unione Europea e poi tutti lo sanno. Quando si finisce la guerra, anche la integrazione europea caserà. Il nostro Presidente lo sa, i suoi colleghi lo sanno, voi lo sapete, anche noi lo sappiamo, ma stiamo discutendo come al funerale di un impeccato senza considerare la corda. Parliamo di prospettive di adizione all'Unione Europea, di espansione dell'Unione Europea, di integrazione, ma nessuno parlerà mai del futuro che è davanti dal Moldavia, come davanti a una sina tengono un carotto con un bastone che non la prenderà mai. Non so voi, ma io non vorrei costruire i rapporti con l'Europa che amo tanto in questo modo vorrei che potessimo rispettarci a vicenza in modo che possiamo parlarci da pari e pari e vorrei anche che potessimo dirci tutti la verità anche se speciavole grazie thank you very much um... I think uh, I would like to, to um, give the floor right now to the Deputy Minister of European Integration of Republic of Serbia, the Honorable Miroslav uh, Gashevich, uh, I think it's well said, thank you, um, which has uh, a huge experience um, in Brussels, in European Union affairs, and I think um, that he might share some ideas with us about the relation with Serbia and European Union and about expectations. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And first, uh, I would like to warmly thank our host, Madame Gupioni, for uh, organizing such a great event. And um, actually, I would like to reflect some of your remarks, both of uh, Madame Gruppioni and, and Professor Durante. But firstly, um, I would like to mention that Serbia's journey towards the European integration started more than, than 20 years ago, actually started after democratic changes in, in, in 2000. Formally, we opened our negotiation process 10 years ago. And uh, when we uh, look back, uh, whether we could be satisfied uh, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the achieved so far, if we ponder our success only by open chapters or, or, or clusters, um, I'm not sure that there is a huge room for uh, joyfulness, bearing in mind that we so far opened 22 chapters out of 35. And, um, but um, if we look towards the substantial uh, 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 um, things, you know, and uh, what is the real power, the, and I would say the, what is the most powerful tool of the EU, that's the transformative power uh, which, which it has. Uh, speaking of which, when you look at Serbian society nowadays and compared to, to the society 10 years ago, it is tremendous change. Uh, Serbia uh, significantly improved uh, its own capacities, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, when we talk about the economy. And um, one of, I would say, one of our biggest achievements is that the uh, majority of our citizens, uh, more than 60%, they believe that reform process, and reform process, it's a very painful process. Uh, you are uh, applying some measures uh, which should uh, 
bring some benefits to society in some future. And, and uh, most often that's not some near future, but distant future. And uh, our biggest success, I would say, is that majority, more than 60% of our people believe in reform process because they think it's beneficial for themselves. And eventually it will, it will pay off. Um, but regarding the, the, the EU itself, <clears throat> I would like to say that ever since we started negotiation process, it was not one-dimensional uh, uh, negotiation process. It always had two dimensions. First is this, uh, let's say, technical uh, uh, dimension, meaning that we, as any candidate country, is obliged to meet certain criteria in order to uh, join the, the bloc. And then there, there's always been uh, 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 that political dimension, political segment, which nowadays we, we are witnessing that, that it's uh, by far prevailing and it's by far the, the most important uh, uh, dimension of the process. Although, again, we, we've been taught that uh, uh, the main thing regarding the accession process is, is meeting certain criteria. And uh, regarding this political dimension, it is very important to stress uh, 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 certain things and, 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 and certain, let's say, uh, fears that we, we've been facing in the, in, 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 in the past, that um, process which was uh, described as merit-based process, now it's uh, uh, almost changed with the perception-based process. And that's, I would say, our biggest uh, challenge because there are a lot of uh, prejudice nowadays about Serbia and now I'm just gonna touch upon a few major uh, uh, things that some uh, across Europe using very heavily when they want to criticize us. Luckily, uh, your esteemed country is not amongst uh, uh, those countries and we are very, uh, thankful and very, um, very much appreciate all your support. And I could really tell you as someone who was, let's say, food soldier, so I really was aware on, on numerous occasions how much uh, uh, Italy helped us in various uh, segments, uh, whether that was a dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina or a negotiation process per se. I'm just going to touch upon this situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, well-known sanctions against uh, 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 Russia and uh, how often we've been criticized and portrayed as uh, uh, Russia's ally uh, or uh, uh, not willing to impose sanctions against Russia, which is true. We, Serbia, did, I mean, hasn't imposed uh, sanctions against Russia. And uh, it has, uh, I mean, I, I'm just gonna try to give you an explanation and uh, sincerely hope that uh, everyone who's not malicious would understand our position. Um, it is true that we were not smart enough to uh, diversify our uh, source of uh, um, um, getting energy, so we are, our energy is heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas, so more than, 95%. Uh, recently, we started the diversifying and now situation is much better, but still we are heavily depending on, 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 on Russian oil and gas. And uh, needless to say, Serbia is not a member of the bloc, so we unfortunately don't have a um, um, variety of options as member of the EU members of the EU have it. So uh, for us, from economic point of view, that was suicidal to impose sanctions on Russia. And I would say there's just one component and which could be regarded as economic component why it was very important, why it was very difficult for us to impose sanctions. Then we have second component why uh, sanctions against Russia was difficult for us. And that's, I would say, it's political component 
uh, meaning that uh, Russia is uh, our staunch supporter when it comes to dialogue between Belgium and Pristina, especially their role, <clears throat> and we see that nowadays especially, their role especially in the Security Council of United Nations is, is, is crucial for uh, safeguarding, uh, I just missed to say this, I mean I should have, I should have said it from the beginning, there is no doubt, and I will justify this uh, uh, claim, there is no doubt that uh, full-fledged membership to the EU is our, uh, the main foreign policy goal, strategic uh, uh, orientation. But on the other hand, or hand in hand, we, we have to preserve our own national interest. And then I'll, I'll connect with this dialogue. So just wanna go back to this uh, sanction issue. So then we have this political uh, segment. And then thirdly, which is equally important, whether we could put it as a social component or emotional component, uh, we were subject of heavily sanctioned, heavily uh, imposed sanctions during the 90s. I mean, I clearly, I, I was, almost teenager back then, so I clearly remember how difficult times, and many of us uh, remember how those were difficult times. And we could tell you, I mean, I could tell you from my own, ex from experience of my own family, who were back then anti-Milosevic. So my family was quite anti-Milosevic. But then at the same time, my family was heavily affected by those sanctions from the people who we were looking as our saviors or, 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 or friends. Sanctions most of the time hit ordinary citizens. Political elites, cronies, they always found their way to bypass the sanctions. Um, additional thing, there is some estimation in Serbia that those sanctions actually helped Milosevic to prolong his power for at least three years. Because, <clears throat> pardon, he managed that thanks to these sanctions, change the sentiment amongst people that he was the, you know, he, he used that as, as, a, as an opportunity to portray West as bad people, bad guys who are trying to hurt all citizens of Serbia. And, I, I, and it was quite useful in, 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 in that uh, aspect. So on the other hand, Serbia amongst the Western Balkans country, countries is the, by far the biggest donor when it comes to support to Ukraine. Um, six months ago, first lady of Ukraine and uh, back then current minister of foreign affairs, they visited Belgrade. And Minister of Foreign Affairs Kuleba, he clearly said that Ukraine is much more interested in, in substance but in form. And then he, I, I actually I have to say, didn't know that uh, 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 data, that 80% of overall support from Western Balkans come from Serbia, 80%. He clearly said, we understand Serbian position vis-a-vis -vis Russia. On the, I mean, at the same time, we are extremely thankful on, on everything what they are doing. So I would say it's highly hypocritical to be lectured of not imposing sanctions if you bear in mind all these uh, facts, especially bearing in mind, I mean, we are still, uh, society in, in transition, especially our economy, relying very much on, on, on investments and everything, but on energy as well. So um, our, our leadership is very much uh, uh, driven by uh, growth, by uh, creating new opportunities for ordinary citizens. So I mean, imposing sanctions towards Russia would cripple our economy significantly. And um, back then and so far, we still uh, didn't get any substantial um, substitute, let's say, for these uh, um, commodities that we are importing from Russia. 
So that's, I would say, one of the biggest uh, prejudice about Serbia. Yes, of course, and just two or three days after war broke out, um, our leadership clearly condemned the war. Um, we uh, joined to numerous uh, UN, I mean all UN resolutions condemning uh, war and, uh, and situation in Ukraine. We, we were uh, voting for uh, suspending the rights of Russia in the Human Rights Council and so on. I mean, the list is uh, very long, so I, I really don't know everything by heart. Um, in, in this context, Serbia is everything but neutral. But again, we, we really have to preserve our own national interests. Um, secondly, that's an, and yes, that's one of our the biggest challenges nowadays in the uh, in negotiation process. Uh, although we've been ready now more than three years, so three years in a row, European Commission recommends opening cluster three, and some of the member states are reluctant and uh, not keen of giving us green light. Firstly, I mean, it was started in December 2021. Back then, one of the ma major, let's say, the, the biggest EU, EU member states, they were skeptical that we would pursue our reform agenda, when a reform um, of, of justice uh, till the end. So they gave, um, they, they gave us only green light for cluster four, and I, because I was involved in these uh, procedures, and they were clearly saying even uh, in, uh, in the fora, that they would give us green light for the, the, the additional cluster once, they, once we fulfilled all uh, requirements regarding this uh, judicial reform. Of course, we fulfilled everything when it comes to judicial reform, but then war broke out, and then uh, the very next day, new conditions were set, and that new condition was uh, uh, fully alignment with the CFSP. Although in negotiation process, I would say that the Bible is negotiation framework, which uh, Serbia signed with all member states. And in this negotiation framework, it's uh, clearly stipulated that uh, candidate country should uh, progressively align with common foreign security policy. And at the moment of uh, becoming full-fledged member, it should be fully aligned. So then we experience just overnight uh, totally uh, 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 different uh, rules. Somehow we managed to uh, mitigate that situation vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine by providing all sorts of uh, help. But then happened something which uh, both of you mentioned, deterioration in, uh, in the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. And uh, Madame Gruppioni, you were more than right that uh, uh, we urgently need bigger international role when it comes to uh, situation in, in, in Kosovo and Metohia, especially in the northern part, because uh, we've been witnessing, especially uh, these days, that situation is unbearable there for, the, for the Serbian citizens. Um, Ever since Kurti came in power, there has been more than 600, 600 attacks against Serbs and Serbian Orthodox Church. So um, idea and agenda is clear, huh? to spread uh, fear, uh, to intimate, intim intimidate uh, remaining Serbs there, so actually to have some uh, why not be blunt, but exodus. I mean, it is exodus in, 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 in real terms. An explanation that we got from just recently, I, I was uh, accompanying my minister at the Bled Strategic Forum, one of the highest uh, EU representatives, that their maximum against uh, Albanians, Kosovo and Tohia, is statement. And so far, we, uh, we've been witnessing that 
uh, leadership in, in Pristina, they couldn't care less about statements they, they are disregarding and, and, and pursuing their, their, their agenda without any consequences. Um, I'm afraid that uh, for a very long period of time situation in Kosovo and Metohia has not been s such a severe as, as it nowadays. Okay? Okay, apologies. Uh, I'm, I'm not a lecturer, I'm not so, so maybe, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, no, no, no worries. I, I was afraid, you know, oh, no, 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 no worries, no worries, no worries, no worries, no worries. No worries. But again, to, to summer, to wrap it up. So um, when it comes to technical criteria, we are fully aware what are the main challenges and this is by far the rule of law, which we've been pursuing and I would say quite successfully. And these political uh, challenges, CFSP, which I, sincerely think that we are performing quite good again, uh, regardless of the fact that we formally did not impose sanctions, but, but this is very important to, to stress. Serbia, you, David O'Sullivan, he's a special envoy of the EU for uh, non-circumvention of sanctions. He's been regarding Serbia on each and every occasion that Serbia is the best example of country which did not impose sanctions on Russia, but is not a territory from where this could be by bypassed by, by others. So we, 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 we are not exploring that option. So we are really sincere in, in, in that. And the second political, uh, the biggest challenge is, is this dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina, and I will just wrap it up with this to return to this Bible negotiation framework where it's again stipulated that Belgrade and Pristina, they are obliged to sign um, uh, formally, um, legally, binding, legally binding agreement on normalization of relations, full stop. What does that mean? Yet to be seen. But I could tell you one thing, the, the, there cannot be zero-sum game. So, uh, and our president reiterated that many times, you know, either we're gonna both be satisfied or, or, or dissatisfied equally. Zero-sum zero game is not, is not an option. And uh, in 2008, when Kosovo, and I'm finishing, when Kosovo declared uh, unilateral independence, many Western countries rushed up to say that um, uh, that was sui generis case. Well, okay, it was sui generis case, now let's find sui generis solution. Thank you. Thank you very much to both speakers. And right now, uh, uh, I will give the floor to the audience. Uh, please. Thank you. Sorry, um, please. Volevo eh, salutare e accogliere il mio collega e amico, l'onorevole Di Giuseppe, anche ad accomodarsi qua con noi. Eh, lui fa parte del partito di maggioranza governativo, è un imprenditore internazionale molto importante, oltre ad essere il presidente del Comitato di Commercio Internazionale del Parlamento. Benvenuto, benvenuto. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know if you want to do an intervention. Uh, I suppose your colleague to, 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 to do an intervention or uh, you, if, you, if you want, obviously. Um, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you. Um, look, the, the question of sanctioning is a little bit tricky. We know that because, you know, and you're right, you're perfectly right that normally the sanction is going to hit uh, ordinary people. But let me underline the importance of there is two types of sanction. What you're talking about uh, is actually the primary sanction. That is what normally Europe do. But, you know, and this government, uh, we can always, you know, find uh, some kind of escape. But we need to understand that uh, if you, we want to, you know, uh, really 
have a leverage on the sanction, we need to act on the secondary sanction. That the secondary sanction is actually the sanction that is going to hit normally the government. That is most likely what you know, United States do. Now, until we are not aligned in the primary and secondary section in terms of, you know, the main international players like Europe and the United States together, we got a problem because, you know, you can close the first entrance and you can enter in the back door. And that is the main point, uh, I guess, because, you know, sanction is the one of the most important tool, should be, one of the most important tool, democratic tool to force some kind of government to, to align on something, but we need to activate that in the proper way and with uh, the international consensus and alignment, especially with the United States. Just that because I think that uh, it's very important to underline this part. I know that is a kind of technical part, but may, may, may I just reflect? Of course. Oh, okay. uh, so you, you, you were totally right, huh? But uh, um, when we try to impose some sorts of sanctions, we discussed this with the, the EAS, uh, 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 the European External Action Service whether it's possible to cherry pick some of the, um, not groups, but how they call it, the, um, not measure, but the, okay, whether we could cherry pick some of the, some of the specific measures and uh, their reading of the procedure was that once we, uh, adopt certain measures, we adopt everything. So it was impossible for us. So because there were some uh, thinking of uh, in, in imposing some sort of sanctions against oligarchs, but it was just uh, formally it was impossible by the EAS because they were telling us it's not just possible to cherry pick, you know, some sort of ag uh, sanctions and, 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 and uh, so it, it's either everything or nothing. And that's actually one of the biggest challenges why we did not uh, uh, embark upon that path, if I may say like that. Regarding the sanctions, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my personal view because I'm a career diplomat, so I've been in service for more than almost 20 years. Huh? I think that two biggest misconceptions of, of this war, let's say the first was uh, on, on, on Russia's side, that they would <clears throat> invade Ukraine and finished everything in a couple of weeks as they were thinking from the beginning. And that's the miscon misconception which goes to, to, to Russia. But correct me if I'm wrong, huh? I think that the second misconception goes towards the Europe and that the sanctions would cripple Russia's economy and I'm not sure that this happened. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, do you want to say something about the sanctions, please? And then we'll give it. Dopo me, sanctioni non hanno alcun effetto positivo. La guerra dura da due anni e durante questo periodo non è stato attenuato nulla, oltre aumento dei prezzi delle risorse energetiche. La economia morendo è il caso, per questo credo che sanzioni non sono buone. E io parlo da mio paese, Moldova. And right now I will give uh, the floor to the audience. Any questions you would, would like to ask? I think there is one there, please.
chiar duceți, vă rog. Nimic. Integrarea europeană deja în Republica Moldova a început acest proces și eu sunt pentru integrarea europeană, dar integrarea în Uniunea Europeană cum a fost constituită uh, inițial, deci o integrare economică europeană și nu politică expansionistă. De aceea acest proces va continua, însă voi restabili relațiile economice și politice cu toate țările lumii, deoarece țara noastră este independentă, neutră și suverană și noi nu avem luxul de a pierde relațiile cu țările Uniunii Europene și țările, țările europene. Traduceți. Il processo per integrare la Moldavia nell'Unione Europea è già iniziato. Io personalmente sono estremamente favorevole all'introduzione della Moldavia nel, nell'Unione Europea, però sono anche d'accordo che questo va fatto anche su un piano politico ed economico. Io ho un obiettivo molto chiaro, integrare la Moldavia in, un, in uh, Unione Europea non solo dal punto di vista politico, soprattutto quando si parla di mire espansionistiche in quest'ultimo periodo, ma anche dal punto di vista economico. Voglio tutelare le relazioni economiche con tutti i paesi del mondo perché la Moldavia è un paese indipendente e come tale non può perdere e non può permettersi questo lusso di perdere le relazioni con qualsiasi paese dell'Unione Europea. Eurasia. Sì. Ok, was everything ok? <laughs> Thank you very much. There is a question over there, please. A gentleman there, would you? Thank you. I have a question for our guests. Uh, what do you expect from the new European Commission concre concretely? Uh, we have the same president, maybe different approach. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, please, Miroslav, I think you can start. Okay, just one and then you reply, please, and then two more questions. It's, it's very, I mean, it's very difficult to say. Um, but we, I mean, the first uh, sign will be, will be the budget. When they designate the budget, we will know how much they are serious about the uh, possibility of, of uh, enlargement. And um, I don't want to be, uh, don't get me wrong, but I'll try to be as blunt as possible, especially bearing in mind that I spent five years in Brussels. So um, everything about the enlargement is about political momentum. Nowadays, we are aware that there is political momentum Unfortunately, not because of the Western Balkans, but because of a uh, um, very unfortunate situation in Ukraine. Um, but whether there is a professor touched upon this issue, I'm, I'm quite positive that no further enlargement would be possible without, without um, without reconstructing EU within itself. Some of the countries you know, you know that much better than I do are uh, heavily lobbying for this uh, QNV. Whether this could be qualified majority, whether this could be a uh, um, uh, solution to, to, to break this impasse, which now has been for a long period of time, very likely because nowadays a lot of countries, a lot of countries would use their uh, uh, would use the fact that they are members to solve some bilateral disputes which of course should not be the issue but there is no any possible tool to prevent this from happening. So uh, It is very good sign that a uh, new commission will be designating commissioner for the enlargement. So now we are getting back where we used to be. So there won't be a commissioner for the neighboring countries or just for the enlargement that there will be commissioner. So that's a positive sign. Whether for the uh, 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 
next term of commission will be um, expansion, so I'm, I'm really not sure. The most logical, I mean, uh, enlargement should be uh, on, on Montenegro and Moldova because of um, just because of the sizes and they, they, they would not be the burden for the uh, budget of the EU. But then on the other hand, if, if, if they're going to create that principle, I'm not sure about um, so many referendums in, in, in because some of the member states, they, they are obliged to uh, organize referendum before the enlargement of the EU. So, I'm not, I'm, so it's, it's up to the, the commission, but definitely there are some positive signs. First, I, I missed to mention this, but this reform agenda and pardon, growth plan is something which is very important, which gives us, uh, I would say, we, we really see this growth plan as a beacon of hope that, uh, again, if not enlarging, but then going to be participating in some of the EU policies, especially single market. These are the very important things. So um, let's see. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Grazie. La politica estera nella Repubblica di Moldova non è dettata da una sola persona. Nella mia competenza applicherò tutte le misure affinché gli organi competenti seguano la falsa dell'integrazione nell'Unione Europea. Ma nella formula indicata anteriore, una formula di negozio, negozione economica, non politica e espansionista, perché io credo che noi possiamo avere grandi relazioni economiche con tutte le state dell'Unione Europea, anche da uh, Eurasiatiche. Ok, uh, we are almost finishing. Uh, we just have probably one minute for one question. Uh, Asaf, please. Thank you both for your time. Just had one quick question to pivot to the Middle East for a second. There was a recent visit now that uh, President of Israel made to Serbia. Bill Burns was in the region. It was, a, you know, met uh, also with Serbia now. What about uh, Serbian-Iranian relations as a result of everything that's going on and the evidence that we have now when it comes to ties between Serbia and Iran as a result of your ties between Serbia and the U.S. and Israel, which is very positive, of course, but of course sanctions on Iran. Uh, your comments on that, I would appreciate. Please be the most brief you can because we don't have much time. It is well known about uh, uh, Iran's influence in, in, in the Muslim world. And bear in mind that Iran is non recognizer. They, they did not recognize Kosovo. So, with uh, straining relations with them, we are jeopardizing not Iran's recognition, but, you know, many. So, that's it. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presence. Uh, we will finish this session. And once more, thank you very much to our host for this Grazie. incredible uh, discussion that was definitely food for thought. Ringrazio. Ringrazio i miei ospiti per questo confronto. Ci avete arricchito e vi aspetto. In bocca al lupo. Crappe al lupo. Sì, così si dice. Grazie, grazie.